Everyone agrees that, that animals deserve respect and humane care. But do they deserve rights? What are the consequences of get, granting rights to animals? Today we report on the latest from the animal rights movement. Welcome once again to Eagle Forum Live with Phyllis Schlafly. Each week, Phyllis and her special guests bring you the most important issues of concern to you and your family. This week, our program is hosted by Ann Corey. Ann and her guest will bring caring and common sense to the question of animal rights. In just a bit, of course, we'll be looking forward to questions and comments from around the country. Here now, Ann Corey. The idea of animal welfare has been a part of Western culture for decades. What is the animal liberation movement and what are their goals? Would granting rights to animals benefit them or would it do something else entirely? Our guest today is Wesley Smith, who is a senior fellow in human rights and bioethics at the Discovery Institute. He is an attorney who has worked tirelessly to oppose assisted suicide and euthanasia. He has just authored... A rat is a pig is a dog is a boy, the human cost of the animal rights movement. Welcome, Wesley. Thank you, Anne. I understand that the title of your provocative book, A Rat is a Pig is a Dog is a Boy, is an actual quote from the head of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. It seems like hyperbole, but is the equation of animals and humans central to the animal rights belief system? Yes, exactly correct. Uh, the quote is um, from the head of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, Ingrid Newkirk. And she was once asked in the late 90s um, uh, whether or not uh, humans have greater value than animals. And she said, no, uh, we have no special rights. Be- a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. In other words, that there is a moral equality between humans and animals, and that is the heart and soul of the animal rights movement. The confusion sometimes comes because um, the term animal rights is used very loosely. It is often used uh, in place of animal welfare, which you uh, rightly pointed out at the, in the introduction, is a human obligation. We have, because we're humans, we have an obligation to treat animals humanely. That's animal welfare. Animal rights is something quite different. It is an ideology, and in fact, it is an anti-human ideology. Well, what is the animal rights activists' end goal? What do they want to do to have animal rights? They want to uh, eventually uh, do away completely with any and all domestication of animals. They want there to be no food animals. They want there to be no uh, animals uh, used in uh, labs to find cures for cancer. And even at some point uh, far down the end of the road, they would not want pets. Uh, They believe that uh, moral value does not come from being human, but from having the ability to feel pain or the ability to suffer. That's known as panience in the movement. Uh, And they believe that since a cow can feel pain and a human being can feel pain, that a cow and a human being are equal in terms of value, and therefore whatever is done to a cow should be judged as if the same thing were done to a human, meaning cattle ranching is the same thing as slavery. Is the purpose of animal rights to diminish the unique moral value of human life? I'm not sure if that's the explicit purpose of it, but it's certainly the, the effect, and it is certainly the belief of the animal rights movement. That is, they deny that human beings have any greater value than animals. Uh, to believe in human exceptionalism like you and I do, that, that basically says human beings do have unique value, and by the way, also unique responsibilities. We're the only known species in the universe that have duties. We're the only ones who are moral agents and have something called right and wrong. But they believe that to believe in human exceptionalism, to believe in the special value of human life, is, quote, speciesism. Uh, and speciesism is deemed as odious as racism. Uh, and therefore, uh, wh- whether or not they want to denigrate human life, they are doing so because they're basically saying we are no different than any, than any other animal in the forest. Well, Wesley, is animal rights a replacement for religion, a belief system that elevates animals to the level of worship? 
I wouldn't say worship in the sense of how you would worship God, but certainly it is a religious, uh, and for some people, a, a substitute for religion that provides many of the benefits of religion, particularly the young. You know, the young today are raised with a very relativistic milieu, and, and sometimes they're just really hungering for absolute rights and wrongs. The animal rights movement, again, to distinguish it from animal welfare, has very firm and clear rights and wrongs, and and uh, and uh, a value system which I find very distorted and and subversive. But it is a clear value system. Human beings have no greater value than animals, and therefore human beings have no right to make any instrumental use of animals. Therefore, eating meat is the equivalent of Auschwitz. And, and I'm not just speaking metaphorically. They really believe that. Let me read your audience something that PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, put out. For several years, they had what was called the Holocaust on Your Plate campaign. Mm. And, and they would uh, go literally, and by the way, they're aiming at, not aiming at people my age. I'm 64. I had an education where I, I learned about certain things that I think may be lacking in young people today. They're, they aim their, their attack on young people who may not have had the same kind of uh, rigorous uh, education that I had in terms of, of uh, uh, values uh, in school. And also, it's a hyper-emotional uh, uh, attack. And, and, here's, here's, and, and people, young people t- tend today to feel rather than think. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and um, so, so they went to all of the rock con- major rock concerts. They went on most major university campuses, college campuses, all around the world. And they basically, not basically, they explicitly said that eating meat was the same thing as Auschwitz. And, and here's the the exact quote. And and by the way, the the the, um, uh, the displays would have photographs juxtaposed to create a moral equivalence. For example, the inmates in the bunks at Auschwitz uh, uh, juxtaposed next to kitchen uh, to chickens in a cage. The most odious was a pile of dead inmates after the liberation of the death camps next to a pile of dead pigs. And considering that the inmates were Jewish, you can see how odious and insensitive that comparison was. And, and here's a quote from, from the actual campaign brochure. Like the Jews murdered in concentration camps, animals are terrorized when they are housed in huge filthy warehouses and rounded up for shipment to slaughter. The leather sofa and handbag are the moral equivalent of the lampshades made from the skins of people killed in the death camps, close quote. And I've been to Auschwitz. I've been to Birkenau. I've stood in a gas chamber. I've seen the crematoria. I've walked that odious train terminus uh, that at Birkenau in which uh, Jews were separated for slave labor and torture or immediate extermination. And any movement that can't distinguish between the worst evil ever done to humankind and animal husbandry has no business preaching morality to anyone. Well, you're certainly right about the young teenagers. When I have talked to teenage girls, they get highly emotional about animals and and the this huge push for vegetarianism among yep. teenage girls is uh, quite detrimental, I think, to their health. Well, it can be if it's not done correctly. I mean, we can eat a vegetarian lifestyle, but particularly veganism, which means no use of any animal product of any kind, whether it's leather shoes, a belt, uh, or any other product, although considering that animal products are, are throughout many products that you wouldn't think they exist in, uh, is probably impossible in this society. Um, it, but it can be detrimental to health veganism if it's not done very, very carefully. I got into this issue uh, in the first place and started thinking about it because I did a speech at an honors high, uh, for an honors class at a high school, and I was speaking about Peter Singer, who you may know of, uh, who uh, is the one who wrote the book Animal Liberation that started basically the animal rights movement, although he doesn't believe in animal rights. He's a utilitarian philosopher, and he believes that what matters is maximizing happiness and reducing suffering. And um, we, I don't want to make this into a philosophy exam, but um, of course that's, that sounds good, but if you're the one deemed to be the cause of suffering, you lose out. Wesley, you were ta- talking about Peter Singer, uh, who is a professor at Princeton University, and as I understand his point of view, 
He thinks that a smart animal is more valuable than a dumb human. Could you explain? Yes, Peter Singer is a utilitarian philosopher who also came up with the quality of life ethic. Utilitarianism has been with us, you know, for hundreds of years. And as I said, it basically says the point of society is to uh, reduce suffering and, and increase happiness. And that, that sounds worthwhile, except there's no such thing as right and wrong in utilitarianism. There are only outcomes that do that uh, increasing of happiness or reducing suffering. And if you were deemed a cause of suffering, you could be eliminated under utilitarian thinking. Uh, the, eugenics, for example, was, was clearly a, eugen- was a utilitarian uh, attempt to improve human happiness by getting rid of the so-called unfit in uh, human life. Uh, what Peter Singer did, did, which others had not done, was said that these utilitarian equations should not be limited to what happens to humans, but should be expanded to the animal world. And he said animals should be given equal consideration, that's a quote, equal consideration in doing these utilitarian analyses. And then he said, well, if there's a conflict between what causes greater happiness or reduces suffering between a human and an animal, it would depend on who has the highest or higher quality of life, which he measures based on mental capacities. And so he said that a, a human baby, for example, is not a person because a human baby cannot value his or her life uh, over time, whereas he says a dog or a dolphin probably can, and therefore uh, the dog or dolphin in that circumstance has a higher value than the human baby. And he, had, he it's not coincidental that not only is he the supporter, the, the jump starter of animal liberation, uh, but he's also the world's foremost proponent for the legitimacy of infanticide. Uh, and and uh, so what the animal rights movement did was they took that kind of thinking of equal consideration and they, they moved pa- even ran past Peter Singer to the point of equal moral worth, uh, which is even more radical than Peter Singer. And, and I was saying how I got into this because you had mentioned how uh, teenagers in particular think very emotionally. And I started thinking it was important to point out these issues to people when I gave a speech at a high school. And I, I talked about the wrongness in that speech of Peter Singer's thinking, because by definition it means there's no such thing as universal human rights. Uh, if, if In order for universal human rights to have any chance of, of, of being supported intellectually, each and every one of us has to have equal moral worth based simply and merely on being human. Go right ahead, Ramona. I, yeah, go ahead. Hello. I would like to know if the activists, animal activists, believe that abortion is a cruel act. Uh, <laughs> the, most of them are very supportive of abortion. Uh, not every single one in terms of... Well, animal. Wesley, how does that make any sense? Well, it doesn't. Uh, let me give you an example. I did a debate at Columbia Law School with Gary Francione. Gary Francione is uh, a, a law professor at Rutgers who uh, says that it isn't just the ability to feel pain that gives value, but mere sentience, and realize that a fly is sentient. And he was asked that very question, and he said, I, su- he said, I support abortion through the ninth month. And, and he was asked, well, wait a second, how can you do that? This is at Columbia University Law School. It's not exactly, uh, you know, the heart of the Bible Belt. And they said, well, how can you do that? And he said, because the woman's right to choose ha- through the ninth month, he said, has to be paramount. So the idea of logic doesn't come in here. This is a part of an ideology that is not isolated onto itself. It is part of a package of generally of ideologies that push a, a very anti-human, anti-sanctity of human life uh, 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 thought process. Well, Wesley, are the animal activists in favor of abortion because they would really like to decrease the human population and they think there are too many humans? I've never heard one say, well, I have heard them say that, that the population reduction is something, human population reduction is something animal rightists would support and desire, again, as as you pointed out, to help the animals. I've never heard one actually go into uh, specifics of how that would be accomplished in terms of abortion, but I think you can draw some logical conclusions. Let's weave over to St. Louis and talk to Bill. Hello, Bill. Thank you for calling. Thank you. I have three questions. First of all, is there any local, state, or federal tax being contributed to PETA, and how much? 
Number two. No, the answer to that, as far as I know, is no. Good. Number two. <laughs> Big. We don't like to have to remember all three at one time, so we'll just knock them out as we go along here. Okay. Number two. Number two, what is the Obama uh, administration's position on PETA? Uh, I don't think the Obama administration has, uh, that I've seen, um, taken any position on PETA. They have not really engaged this particular issue, as far as I know. Okay. Number th- well, that was 2A. Number th- the second <laughs> question is, what percentage of the people in the United States are involved in this? Oh, that's a very important and interesting question, because a lot of people are involved in supporting animal rights when they think they're supporting what you and I would call animal welfare. So people like uh, the groups like the Humane Society of the United States, which is led by Wayne uh, Paselli, who is a very radical animal rights activist, although he doesn't talk about it anymore, uh, I have a quote from him uh, in A Rat as a Pig as a Dog as a Boy, in which he actually says as he, that he wishes there would be no more cats and dogs uh, because he doesn't think they belong here. Um, Is that because they're domesticated? Yes, exactly. But he, as head of the Humane Society of the United States, he stopped pitching the ideology. What Humane Society of the United States does is brings constant litigation and pressure against any animal industry, particularly those involved in food production, uh, to try to make life more difficult for them, more expensive for them, and so forth. It's kind of a chewing from the outside in. And animal rights activists see this as a multi-generational project. They know it's not going to happen in five years. I also have to say that the Humane Society of the United States, which I consider a stealth animal rights group, is not the same as your local humane society. They've taken that name, Humane Society of the United States, but they don't run any pet shelters, for example, whereas your local Humane Society will run a pet shelter. There's a distinction there, and I think HSUS tries to confuse in people's minds. Uh, PETA also uh, will do two things. They'll, they'll, on one hand, they'll pitch the animal uh, rights ideology, but sometimes they'll do something that people can support that would try to prevent an, a cruel practice to animals. So people have to try to distinguish between what is animal rights and what is animal welfare. Animal rights core ideology is relatively small, and some of them are violent. Uh, But uh, people who think they support animal rights is very large because they're confused with animal welfare. I think a lot of people who love dogs and cats are very fond of the, the humane society, and they just see it as the humane society. So right. how do you... And the local humane societies suffer from that, because people who, who, who really don't like the humane society of the United States will confuse them with that, or they will send uh, contributions to the humane society of the United States when they think they're supporting their local pet shelters, and they're not. The Humane Society of the United States gives very, very little money to local humane societies and, of course, is not officially affiliated with them. Let's work in another caller here. Scott, thank you for calling Eagle Forum Live. Hi, Scott. Hey, I wanted to, uh, to ask how these animal rights activists rationalize the fact that if humans shouldn't eat animals, then why do animals eat animals? Great question, <laughs> Scott. Wesley? So I, it was a little garbled. The oh. question is, how do they justify how human eats a, eat animals? Why, animals eat in other animals? words, if if the humans are just another animal in the forest, why are we not allowed to eat be carnivores when the animals themselves are carnivores? Well, this is ironic because they hold us out to special duties that they can't hold out to animals, but because of course animals aren't capable of it. So when you really think about it, animal rights is about imposing draconian, anti-human, and self-destructive duties upon us that you would not hold on to animals because you cannot hold them out to animals. If animals have rights, only we will have to honor animal rights. Animals will not have to honor other animal rights because they can't, and they certainly won't have to honor our rights because they can't. That is the true irony of the animal rights movement. I've often gotten the impression that only cute, furry animals have rights. Uh, I mean, that in the publicity that the animal rights activists have done, the pictures are, have these very sad eyes, and they anthropomorphize the animals. They give them human, uh, pretend to give them human characteristics, but, um, and they want this soft, fuzzy image of animal rights. 
Right. That's because that's how they get contributions from for, from people who are who are pet lovers and supporters of animal welfare. They will show abused animals uh, being rescued and this kind of thing. Uh, of course, we, animal abuse is a terrible wrong, but it's a wrong because it violates human duties to animals. One of our duties is to treat animals humanely. And when we don't, uh, Michael Vick, uh, when he tortured those fighting dogs, uh, it wasn't the rights of the dogs, it was the abuse by the human. Uh, and, and what drives me crazy is Michael Vick gets caught, and who did the media turn to? PETA. Well, PETA doesn't hate Michael Vick simply because of the animal rights, I mean the animal uh, abuse. He sh- we shouldn't be allowed to actually use animals at all. And if you take a look at what they'll say, they'll say things like, well, you have to make sure that all dogs and cats are neutered. Well, I certainly believe in neutering programs, uh, but if you neutered all dogs and cats, there wouldn't be any more. And that's, that's the idea. They're trying to put uh, pet breeders out of business and this kind of thing. They say, uh, well, if you're going to have a dog, take it out of a local pound or shelter, and I, I support that kind of thing also. But I also support dog breeders and and that whole industry because it provides great joy to people and of course great joy to the dogs the goal of PETA is no domestic animals and and that issue of the cute animals notice that um, they want to stop lab rats from being experimented on to find a cure for human cancer in fact here in Santa Cruz I live in California a few years ago in Santa Cruz some animal rights uh, activists put wanted posters with the with cyanist faces on them who worked in at in uc santa cruz doing experiments for example with lab rats wesley much of the animal rights movement is anti-business anti-capitalism and anti-science the activists want to make meat too expensive to eat for example but tell us how they want to stop science well they want to stop all animal research which is essential to the advancement of science you know, it's also essential to the protection of, of human rights. Animal research is required by the Nuremberg Code. Uh, before something is done in a human being, it needs to be tried in an animal. And that's a, both an efficacy question and a safety question. So uh, a, a, in terms of animal research, PETA, for example, has said that there is no scientific value to using animals in research. That's a flat-out, bald-faced lie. Of course there's value in using animals in research. It can show whether something, uh, whether scientists are on the right track, and it can prevent people from being hurt uh, in experiments uh, that haven't been tried on animals. Now, they will say, well, you can use uh, skin lines or computer models. Yes, you can. But at some point you have to try things in a living organism. And that living organism is either going to be an animal or it is going to be a human being. And for protection and for safety and for human rights, we must support it in human beings. One other point, a lot of medical research is basic biological research, where you're trying to find out how systems work before you try to come up with a a method, say, for curing a disease. You can't do that in human beings. You can only do that in animals or not do it. So if, if the animal rights activists had their way and, and scientists couldn't do animal research, advances in science and medicine would come to a screaming halt. Anybody who's had any medical treatment that has been created over the last 50 years can thank, at least in part, an animal researcher for that treatment and that benefit. Next stop is Kansas City, Missouri, listening to Eagle Forum Live. We now have Steve. Go right ahead, Steve. Hi, Steve. Yeah, my qu- hey, how you doing? <clears throat> my question has to do with how do you argue with people who have this uh, ideology? Um, apologetics has developed. Uh, we didn't have the level of apologetics 20 years ago that we do now. We, we have a better grasp on it. Uh, laws of non-contradiction, uh, logical fallacies, these kinds of things. But uh, this is a little bit of a different animal, pardon the pun. Uh, how do we how do we argue this? Uh, law of non Th- Thanks, Steve. I think really it's a question of rational thought versus emotion. What do you say, Wesley? Uh, yes, and and you know a debate can only occur when you have a common frame of reference. 
So, for example, during the Cold War, there would be debates over the best approach, but the ultimate outcome, which was the defeat of communism back in the 50s and 60s and so forth, was agreed upon. So you would debate over the means while you agreed on the ends. With animal rights, it's very difficult because true animal rights activists have a completely different worldview than, than Steve does. So what can you do? You can't necessarily argue with them in the sense of, of persuading that your goal, your means is the proper means because they don't have the same goal as you do. But you can expose it to most people who actually share the idea of the unique value of human life and are unaware that the animal rights movement doesn't believe in that. So what you do is you expose the consequences of different world views and the details of different world views. So when, when somebody thinks that animal rights is about being nicer to animals, you say, yes, of course we should be, be nicer to animals, but that's animal welfare. Animal rights actually thinks that the squirrel has equal value to your son. And when you go in that direction and you force the true animal rights activists to say, yes, the squirrel does have equal value to your son, that's when you'll win the debate among the general public. Let's pick up another caller here on the toll-free 800-736-3202. Rolla, Missouri. Hello, Brenda. Hello. I want to know if there are organizations under other names that are linked to PETA where donated money would be actually diverted over to PETA. Brenda, what an excellent question. Wesley? Yeah, you know, I, I would hesitate to be specific about that because I haven't done that kind of a study. But what, what the caller should do is to uh, go to uh, PETA's public documents, uh, they are a nonprofit, and there will be a list that they have to su- supply in their tax documentation uh, as to uh, who all of their or what uh, organizations have contributed to them. Uh, so that is publicly available information. There's something, uh, Center for Consumer Freedom, which is an anti animal rights organization that's funded at least in part by the food industry, uh, that might also have that information available. Center for Consumer Freedom. Wesley, in your book, a rat is a pig is a dog is a boy. You spend some time talking about the the terrorism that some of the animal rights uh, organizations have done, and it's quite harrowing. And I've got I get the impression that PETA is a mob organization that intimidates and shakes down businesses for their nefarious purposes. Well, PETA does not specifically promote violence in its work, although. It gets very close. There's something where it is basically equated animal liberation to the French resistance movement. Well, the French resistance movement was not nonviolent, you know, <laughs> against the Nazis. Uh, but what you will see are some animal rights organizations that are quite explicit in their promotion of violence. Uh, uh, there's also something called ancillary targeting, which is pushed by something called uh, Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty, Shack. Uh, Shaq uh, try, is trying to destroy an animal testing lab uh, because it does animal research. And let me just give you an example of the kind of tactics that something like Shaq or other radical animal rights violent activists uh, do. There was a guinea pig farm in the U.K., and this, these farmers raised guinea pigs for use in medical research, and they raised the pigs humanely. But the reason they were attacked by animal rights activists was because they were raising guinea pigs for medical use, right? So what did they do? They not only harassed and threatened the family that was raising the guinea pigs, they then started harassing and threatening the neighbors of the family. They then started threatening the banks, that which the neighbors might use and this kind of thing, to try to get the banks to stop uh, allowing them to have accounts. And they finally drove the family out of the guinea pig raising business by stealing the body of the grandmother out of her grave and telling the family we will not give her back until you stop being a guinea pig raiser well you can imagine the family said fine we're not going to do this anymore give us back grandma and even then they wouldn't give back the body until they were caught by the police and it was part of the plea bargain uh for the criminal prosecution in uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, near where I live, uh, as I said before, animal researchers were put on wanted posters, and this one woman's house was firebombed. An incendiary device blew up on the porch of her house. Uh, she and her children had to escape down a rope from a second-floor bedroom, 
and and she gave a public statement. She said, "I'm just I'm using lab rats humanely to find a cure for cancer." And that sound you heard was me yelling, "Lady, they don't care about the li- women with breast cancer. They care about the rats." Let's see what Tom has on mind right now from Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello, Tom. Hello. Yeah. Wonderful program. I would, Wesley, I would call myself an, um, an animal welfare uh, inter- interested in that, but not interested in the animal rights movement. But my question would be, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, there's a, a situation right now, a woman uh, breeding dogs outside of town, and I won't mention that city or the name of the kennel, but uh, unfortunately uh, she had been neglecting these animals, and it took a long time for the authorities to finally move in. And what they found were uh, over 25 dogs that had been neglected, uh, half of them uh, were euthanized, and the others had uh, infections and had lost eyesight and things like that. Now, I I was wondering what your take would be on how we would do a better job of handling uh, dog breeding of these kennels. How do we monitor that, or what can we do to make sure that these things don't happen as often as they do? Thanks, Tom. Uh, well, for, <clears throat> yes, Go ahead, Wesley. First, that is an abhorrent thing. Those are known as puppy mills. Uh, and there are people who breed dogs very unethically, uh, and, uh, and, the, and they need to be put out of business, as this woman was. And, and I think part of the problem is law enforcement uh, resources. But there are professional dog breeders who, who belong to professional organizations that are required to uh, attain to certain ethical and safety measures. And I would uh, research those dog breeding groups. If you want to get a, a purebred dog uh, then, and, and visit the place, Get a tour of the place from which you're going to get a puppy to make sure that these puppies are treated properly. Don't just come to a porch, pay $25, and take a puppy. Uh, Check out the place you're getting the dog from, because there are very ethical dog breeders who are also very interested in putting these puppy mills out of business because it gives all of them a bad name, and then it gives the people for the ethical treatment of animal types the pretext to go after the legitimate industry of dog breeding, which they do. So there are professional organizations out there, and they will have uh, help uh, on their websites and so forth to tell you what to look for when you're trying to find a good dog breeder. And, of course, people who abuse animals should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Wesley, I've known dog breeders where the dogs live a lot better than the humans who are caring for them. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. Uh, Why have so many celebrities jumped on the animal rights movement? It always seems, PETA seems to always get a lot of celebrity endorsements. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think um, it's a good uh, career move for a lot of these celebrities. Uh, They want to be seen as promoting, as, as you pointed out, the emotional stuff, and it's also an appeal to young people. Uh, so uh, a lot of them will are also, by the way, unaware of what we're discussing, and so they'll they'll see PETA saying how cruelly supposedly animals are treated, let's say in the fur industry, and they'll say so they'll say oh I'll be in an ad that says I won't wear I'll wear nothing before I wear fur, and they'll get naked, and they'll take that kind of a picture. Alicia Silverstone is a movie star uh, who who is a true believer in animal rights, and she'll uh, do uh, videos of her getting naked out of a pool, and that attracts a teenage boy crowd. Uh, I just think it's a matter of kind of empty uh, knee-jerkism on the part of some movie stars who think they have to be in a supposedly progressive cause to help their careers. Go, Butch. Uh, I live in north-central Arkansas, and my father is a cattle rancher. Do these people uh, put all animals into one into one uh, category. I mean, are they all to be protected? What are they? Are they? Are these people um, um, vegetarians? All of them. Thanks, Butch. I think that's a good question. Go ahead, yeah. Leslie. The true animal rights believer does not distinguish between a rat, a pig, a dog, or a boy. In other words, all animals have equal value, and the basis of that is the ability to suffer the ability to feel pain, or as, as Gary Francion puts it, even mere sentience. Uh, so uh, the goal of the animal rights movement would be to put Butch's father completely out of business because they think he's engaged in evil activity that is the moral equivalent of human slavery. But that brings up an interesting irony. You know, if we all became vegan, meaning all, and had no use of animal products and ate nothing but grain and fruit and, and vegetables and so forth, that doesn't mean 
we wouldn't be killing animals in the, in the production. There are lots of, of bugs in the ground. You would, not only bugs in the ground, but if you, if you have a combine harvesting a wheat field, there are mice, snakes, birds, uh, rats that are being slaughtered in the blades of those combines in a far more cruel way than any uh, cattle is slaughtered at a slaughterhouse. And you bring this up to the vegan who think they say meat is murder, and I respond, no, vegan is as much murder as meat, although you can't murder an animal. But if meat is murder, so is vegan because of that very fact that you're killing millions of, of animals. And since the animal rights activists can't distinguish between a pig and a, and a mole, uh, then they are certainly as guilty of uh, killing animals in support of a vegan lifestyle as a person who eats a steak. They go crazy. They go nuts. They say, well, that's not our intent. But you know what's going to happen. It's reckless indifference to these animals. Uh, you, you poison uh, rats and, and mice in the silos to keep them from eating the food. So there is no way, unless you grow a, like a pineapple tree or something, that you're going to be able to, in our mechanized society, eat without having had animals die in the process of bringing that food to market. It's just impossible. It's not something we like, but it's the actual truth. Well, Wesley, you, the vegan diet is a very difficult diet to maintain, yeah. but you alluded earlier that there are a lot of animal products that we live with that people don't see and realize are animal products. Right. It's in, it's in uh, lubricants. It might be in... Uh, in um, you take a cow. They use every bit of that cow. There's no, it, it's really an amazingly productive endeavor because you not only eat the steak, they use the, the various other parts, you know, there's like in pet foods, but beyond that, it's in lubricants. Uh, I think it's in uh, some uh, non, supposed non-meat foods. You will find animal products that cut across into the depth and breadth of society. It is a very efficient use of a very important resource. And, and that brings up uh, an important point. We as human beings have an obligation to animals to treat them humanely, and that's why you see an increasing uh, um, people like Temple Grandin trying to help improve animal husbandry methods. I often speak to animal ag groups, right, and they're very interested in improving animal uh, husbandry methods, to improving the humaneness with which they treat animals and so forth. Well, a happy... Uh, uh... But, we, but, but we owe each other you know how much it would cost for food if you couldn't have uh, certain industrial methods of raising cows? But isn't that one of the points, is to make food more expensive? Exactly. Exactly right. And one of the mistakes I think the animal industry is making is they allow what they do to be defined by animal rights activists. And, of course, nobody believes in torturing animals, but there's there's... Also, the need to understand that it just can't be old McDonald's farm. We have, in this country alone, more than 300 million people to feed. You have to have efficient methods of raising food. And that can be done humanely, is mostly done humanely. And if it's not being done humanely, then we need to change those practices. Let's see what Julia has for us right now here on Eagle Forum Live. Thank you for calling, Julia. Yes, uh, I just want to comment that I am a breeder and have been a breeder for a number of years. And unfortunately, this last year, uh, under the recommendations of my state inspector, gave some dogs up to a rescue center. And now I have suffered the circumstances of that by being um, picketed, have posters, it's been on the news, that I am some kind of an animal user, and uh, I've had to relinquish my license, and they're cut do it. They're you know I'm facing possible jail time and monetary fines, and I don't know how to combat this. These animal rights activist groups, uh, the people that uh, were the dogs were given to, haven't even been to my property. Well, thank you, Julia, for your comments. Yeah, and you know, obviously, I can't. Uh, comment on her specific situation, but I can tell you that animal rights activists are bullies. They will find somebody who might make the news, uh, and they will then uh, descend on that person or that that company and try to drive them out of business in just this way. And uh, 
assuming let's assume Julia actually did not abuse her dogs, then it's really it seems to me up to co breeders to help Julia defend herself. There needs to be a mutual defense pact that if you know that there should be minimum standards created by these industries that if somebody or a company is being attacked who has met those standards and has not in- abused the animals, then even though they might be a competitor, there should be a mutual defense pact to help with legal costs, to help counter public relations uh, issues and so forth. What often happens instead is that uh, a, another company in the same business will say, well, gee, that just means more business for me, right? Or they will say, if I keep my head down and I hide under the desk, they won't come knocking on my door. But what these animal industries have to understand is eventually they're going to pound on every door. Now here's David listening at Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. Hello, David. Yeah, hi. Thank you. Um, Yeah, you know, here recently, I think it was about six months ago, PETA got got caught for, uh, I believe it was in Virginia, I'm almost pretty sure, for... uh, they were only adopting out a few dogs, and it was, I believe, killing our, killing the rest, like 97%. Yes, they and, have an, uh, their, their, their headquarters is Norfolk, Virginia, and they have an extremely high kill rate in their uh, animal shelter. Uh, and, in fact, they have admitted in the past that they have euthanized some adoptable pets. They will say that, well, the reason we have a higher kill rate is that we take in animals that just are too ill and too injured to be adopted. But they do, they do euthanize some adoptable pets. And it's a very interesting question as to why that occurs. There was this uh, terrible case, I think it was in South Carolina, where they, two PETA people went around in a van and they convinced these animal shelters that didn't have good funding to give them the dogs that they would take them back and and treat them right. And what they did is they killed them in the vans and then tossed them in uh, these these, uh, trash bins. And there was this big, huge deal. And the irony is PETA actually won the case against against the – they were brought on criminal cases. And the defense was, wait a second, once we got those dogs, we owned them. So in order to win the case – PETA actually made a legal argument against what PETA believes because PETA be- doesn't believe we have the right to own animals. Well, Wesley, are you saying that really PETA is just a political organization with an agenda and doesn't have actual humane treatment and, and care for animal welfare? I, I think that, uh, that PETA is uh, a very disturbed organization that sometimes acts contradictory to its own belief system that is anti-human and has lifted animals to such an anthropomorphic and emotional level that it almost could be called a cult. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Wesley Smith. We appreciate your common sense approach to the question of animal welfare. We've been discussing the compelling book, A Rat is a Pig is a Dog is a Boy.